service to Seekill in 2020. In this role, he worked closely and tirelessly with the Dalai Lama, with the Tibetan parliament and the entire exile government on behalf of Tibetans around the world. Among his many achievements, his efforts on policy stand out. And so two examples are the 2014 Tibetan rehabilitation policy um, of the government of India. And then in 2020 with the US Congress, the Tibetan Policy and Support Act of 2020. And both of these are major pieces of legislation for Tibet. India, China, the USA were undoubtedly the focus of his tenure as Sikkim, but his travels and his accomplishments were on every single continent around the world including, for example, important political action in both Japan and the Czech Republic. During his tenure, we also saw major work and transformation in Dharamsala in terms of infrastructure, relations with India, health concerns, and perhaps most tellingly, in both creating and sustaining programs for youth leadership, which is such an important sign for the future. I'd also note more somberly that Sikkel Mosa Sange also led the community through an incredibly difficult period of death and protest and that is the over 160 Tibetans who chose to self-immolate as a form of protest against the Chinese government and the two local individuals inside Tibet. Maintaining a sense of community and a sense of hope in this time required both skillful and compassionate leadership. So for these achievements and more, I'm truly honored to welcome former Sikhel Mosang Senge to our campus. I'm especially delighted that so many students are here with us tonight. The University of Colorado is a global leader in Tibetan studies, and so Tibet tonight's event is especially fitting. I'd like to thank the three units that made tonight's event possible, um, which are the Department of Anthropology, the Center for Asian Studies, and the Tibet Himalaya Nation. And now everyone, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sikhan Mosang Center. <laughs> Meditations. So, 
if you are a person, let's say, with a beard, he will hold your beard and pull you. <laughs> Don't you? Huh? And if you have a moustache like that, he will, you know, play with your moustache, sometimes pull it down. I mean, you, you spend many minutes in the morning, right, making sure your moustache are, you pull it down, right? And it is also politically incorrect if you have big nose, you say, oh, big nose, big nose. <laughs> um, and if you have a big head, you say, big head, big head. Now, can you imagine, it's all in this dialogue, we're going to meet the president of America, Barack Obama, at the White House. That's a serious stuff, right? And when he's already meets Barack Obama, first thing he says is, oh, big ear, big ear, big ear. Big ear. <laughs> he plays with the ear, and Obama also says, oh, you notice, know huh? <laughs> so each time you, uh, he met with, uh, he used to joke, oh, today also I played with this ear. You know? So he's like that. Then if you're bald, that's it. You say, you look like me. <laughs> you rub your head and give you one, one back. Sometimes quite hard. <laughs> so he plays with everybody, and that's it. And then um, another story, this is politically correct. He was giving a talk at Harvard University, so he had to enter through a tunnel up the stairs. So in the tunnel, in the basement, there was office as well. So we cleared the tunnel. So I was with the Solomon's and security. We were walking. And then one lady, you know, just opened her office cabin and came up with a fire, right? She was literally walking towards other direction. And as soon as he saw the dialogue, he saw this lady, he went running. Gave her one back. You know. She was like, my children, who the hell hit me? You know? She turned around, she saw this Dalai Lama. You know? Everybody knew. Like, she was like, surprise, and also, you know, pleasant, you know, pleasant surprise. And then he gave her a big hug, right? And they all started laughing. And what did he say to her? You know, she, was so pretty, pretty, pretty. <laughs> she laughed, you know, and then her husband walked together to the stairs and they walked, walked up the stairs and he said bye bye to her and she said bye bye to him. And she shares the story. Oh um, my man, he gave me one whack and told me that. And she doesn't, she was not offended. Why? Because you see, the motivation and intention of his solidness was clear, right? That's why people don't get offended. And uh, once I was in Washington, D.C., uh, and met with uh, you know, the Senate majority at Henry, uh, and then it's very difficult to get meetings. Okay? And there was this lady, woman, who arranged this meeting. She was the advisor of Homeland Security. And, uh, uh, and then she helped me, and I, was, I asked her why. And she said, you know, um, once you know, she, was, you know, she was pregnant, and she went to a doctor, and the test showed something negative, you know. And the doctor told her something's wrong with your baby. So can you imagine you're pregnant, ever give birth, and the doctor says something is wrong with the baby. You get terrified, right? And then he saw that Zara was coming to Washington, D.C. So a lot of the people were lined up, and she was also lined up, and he saw that walked, you know. And then, you know, he, you know, he was shaking hands, and as, as uh, he saw her, and he pointed at her belly and said, Pregnant, pregnant, teasing, you know, and rub her belly. Now, a monk supposed to be here, uh, rubbing woman's belly doesn't sound that politically correct, right? But when she was telling me the story, she was in tears, almost in tears. She said, you know, and then three days later, she went to the doctor, the doctor said, Skin, nothing is wrong with you. She literally believed. That because the Lama touched her belly, he cured whatever the problem the baby had. Now, in one context, it's politically incorrect to touch a good belly as a monk, right? But in another context, she was very grateful. So, you know, we, we all must know that the Lama is very grateful. And then, you know, he just uh, made uh, quite a lot of things. Now, Kali B also said that that was, this is the context why there is a headline news about this audience, like all oh, this powerful man abusing their power and things like that. Now let me give you a story. No one knows this, okay, except for 10 people. No one knows the story. During COVID, we all were scared. Yes or no? One, more than a million people died in America, also in India. 
America was number one, India was number two. Then also many people have died so far, especially the elders. And his Holiness the Lama fits in that category. He was 85 and he was 86 years old. Yes, right? Very vulnerable. So I was coming to Washington, D.C. His first physician, Dr. Setella, asked me, hey, go to the D.C. You know, the America is almost coming out with Pfizer vaccine. Can you arrange some for his Holiness? And I had a friend in at the White House and talked to him. And he said, okay, it can be arranged. And he told the vaccine coordinator at the White House that in uh, November uh, and December of 2020. So, and then uh, they communicated to the U.S. Embassy in Delhi. And I also knew the ambassador, Ken Jester, the staff, Graham. We talked and he said, okay, you know, there will be uh, 100 vaccines, 100 shots for His Holiness, Dalai Lama, and people around. So I was very happy. I said, I do something that a big Pfizer was allowed to be launched, right? And we thought we have to protect our treasure. This all is the alarm. And only vaccine could have protected. And then the physician and the private secretary at the time goes to his holidays and says, Your Highness, we are getting a vaccine for you. American government didn't even give you a vaccine. You know what does this all say? said? Said, me? Why? 1.4 billion Indians, they're not getting vaccine. I see these local Indians here and there, they're not getting vaccine. Why should I get vaccine first? I wait till all the people in India get vaccine. Please take the government of America that I don't want that vaccine. Can you imagine how many multi-millionaires and billionaires and rich and the powerful scramble to get vaccine for them and for their parents and you know, grandparents. Yes, sir. If you're trying, this always refused to take vaccine from American government. Now, after a few months, government of India launched AstraZeneca vaccines, which is 67% effective. Okay, Pfizer is 93% effective. The Solid Dalai Lama said, I'll take 60% effective AstraZeneca. Then his private secretary and the physician again called me out and said, Hey, can you ask the you know, health minister of India to give this shot at his residence you know, so that his Solid doesn't have to go? Local hospital because COVID is infected through contacts. More people there are, more chances you will get COVID, right? So you have to prevent the soldiers that are 80, almost 86 years old from going to the local hospital. And then I, I talked to the health secretary and I talked to the health minister, Himachal Pradesh, that's the state, and the health secretary. They all agreed and they called the chief medical officer of Dharamsala and he also agreed. Then he called the physician, the private physician of the soldiers. And said, okay, we are ready to bring 15 shots to the Solid residents. The Solid and the people surrounding will be given AstraZeneca shots tomorrow at his residence. And then he also, this is such a good news. And then they all approached the Solid and said, the Solid is, they are coming to give you a shot. He said, why? Why should I take shot here? I should, I should take shot like any other the local Indians. I'm going to go to the local hospital. And he went to the local hospital to take the shot. So if there's anyone in the world who will not use his popularity or power or influence, this is Solomon's now. COVID was life and death issue. Right? People were scrambling to get COVID shot. This is issue. Pfizer. Or he went to the hospital. So unless you know these stories about this Solomon, he makes fun of everybody. You just can't comment and say, my goodness, look at this picture, you know? So yes, news media covered it, okay. And yet, it did look odd. And as a Tibetan, and as a Buddhist, we would say, my God, that boy is so lucky, you know? This is how Tibetan view. He must be some special, he must be boy of some special karma. And he's in the time to Yes, in Western context, it might be politically incorrect. It's understandable. That's why Islam's Dalai Lama often issued an apology. Okay, if you have hurt someone, including the boy or anyone, I'm sorry. And it's time to move on. Why play this out? Now, if news media, if they're so concerned about children, yes, they should be concerned about children. What about one million Tibetan children? 
who are sent to colonial boarding schools, who are uprooted from their nomadic and farming families, who are forced to send to boarding schools, where they're citizens, where they're taught only Chinese. What about that? One village where the children. UN human rights experts have written a report and expressed their concern that one million Tibetans are getting sinicized, made into Chinese, forcibly, with no choice whatsoever. What about one million Tibetan children? Did you cover this news? No. But you play up these headlines. So I urge news media, including those celebrities who have no idea what they're talking about, let's move on. And that's deal with serious stuff, including human rights violations and Xinjiang politics. So with that, that's my brief comment on this issue, because after listening to me, you might wonder, oh, what the hell is going on here? When you Google, that might that news might pop up. But you must understand this audience as a person. Anyone who has been close to him will, oh yeah, that's his audience. By the way, my own experience, okay? So in 2011, as uh, Carol explained, I got elected, and uh, obviously I thought I'm the Prime Minister of Tibet, the government exile, I should be very dignified, and I should be learned, and you know, I should be serious, and his holiness was introducing me to the Tibetan public. And so it's all of us saying, yeah, he has good education, he has this, this, this degree from Harvard and all that, but his Tibetan is like a school kid. <laughs> I am a leader of the Tibetan people. I am supposed to give speech in Tibet. My oratory in Tibet is supposed to be good, right? You know? Yes or no? <laughs> and it's always a no. Yes, yes, Tibet is like a school kid. And then everybody laughed. I was a bit embarrassed. I was so loud. That's his all this for us. Okay, he's politically inclined. You know? He says stuff, you know? But did I feel anything towards him? Not at all. He's sincere. He's clear. He's clean. You know? I have utter respect for him. Devotion towards him. So that's his solemnness. So, you know, we have, I have many, many stories to share like that. But today's, you know, because we have the half the poster is about his solemnness, my photo is attached, I must, you know, come and explain to him who um, he is. Um, so hopefully, media will take note of this and you know, write uh, this stuff as well. Here it is. So, this is for all the students now. You better take quick notes. I'm going to uh, you know, change it in a minute, okay? <coughs> so, this is going to take on Dharma Exile, Democracy as a Teacher of Dalai Lama, Chronology of Tibetan Democracy Exile, Factors for Democracy Exile, that are not today. And five, number five, I want to say, uh, number six, I'm to say, but and then structured government exile, parliamentary process, department selection campaign, perils of being a leader of an exile government. So these are the topics. So obviously this is what Chinese government says about Tibetan government. It's still legal. The <coughs> Chinese government never talked with it. So they never talked to it formally. So Dalai Lama, again, the song is Dalai Lama comes with him. This is, I mean, what is this? I have to stretch my neck so that I can this is a test. Um, so, this is a typical Tibetan you know, democracy. It's a gift of the Dalai Lama. So, in 1989-88, when the Soviet Union was you know, collapsing, there was a culture where everybody was asking for, the people were asking for democracy, and the leaders had question marks on their heads because they had no clue what people were talking about. And there was, a, you know, next to it, there was a, another alternative, a, another cartoon where Dalai Lama was talking about democracy, 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 and Tibetan people had question mark on their heads. So what, what is he talking about, right? Because for us Tibetans, democracy was given to us by the Dalai Lama. It was never a public or grassroots or bottom-up demand at all. It's always been given to us. And then this is it. There was a Tibetan referendum. He said, now we must have a referendum. It's all as Dalai Lama said. Now you, the people, should decide. But people said, no, 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 you decide for us. He said, no, 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 I said you decide. And Tibetan people say, yes, actually we have. We decided in favor of whatever you decide. <laughs> so the referendum choices were independence, self-determination, and uh, what is it? middle way. These are three choices, right? And then what, what did Tibetan people do? They, they wrote a fourth column. 
whatever the lemma decides is okay by us. So, and then this is the parliament. Whenever there's a grid law, they say, we better consult the dialogue. Now, the Zoranist dialogue has devolved his political authority to the House of Levitt. He separated the church and the state, and all the political and administrative matters should be handled by elected leaders. Parliament is still disagreed, oh, no, no, we better ask the alarm, you know. So still, for students, better take quick notes. You will not get these notes, huh? It will take months to do research, okay, if you have the right paper. So, in 1952, in Tibet, there was a reform committee established by the Chinese government, by, by the Solomon Dalai Lama, but it was uh, made uh, ineffective because of the Chinese uh, government pressure. In 1959, after fleeing to exile, there was a grand vote. We all will pledge uh, towards the Solomon and the Dalai Lama, and the Dalai Lama said, we must have election. Can you imagine, 1959, March of 1959, 80,000 Tibetans have barely come to India. In September, we had the first election and first parliament. Six months. And, uh, uh, and then in 1963, there was a constitution. And in the constitution, in 1963, okay, and his son Dalai Lama said, there must be a provision for impeachment of the Dalai Lama. She was like, what are you saying? How can we impeach you? He said, no unless there is an impeachment of me in the you know, constitution, it can't be a democratic <coughs> system. So the people who were involved in translating the constitution was criticized, you know. This is sacrilege. Why are you bringing this provision? Why did you, I didn't do it. It's always there, I'm told me to put it there, you know. So we got a big issue, but we have an impeachment clause in the constitution because that insisted. And in 1963, we had a woman parliament in the second round, so three years later, we elected members of parliament, and the Solomon Dalai Lama said, no, no, we need women representation in the parliament house. We have women representation. Far ahead of European countries, okay, including Switzerland. 1977, uh, minority fund relations, so everybody was represented in the parliament. 1985, direct appointment of the parliamentarians. 1991, the constitution was changed to charter. <coughs> Election of the cabinet by the parliament, 1991, 93. Again, this is very important because often I'm asked this question. Oh, you became a prime minister of Tibetan government, exile. So your goal is to restore government in exile in Hassa, in Tibet, and I will become prime minister of Tibet. No. The Solidarist Dialogue made it very clear. In 1993, when the Tibet issue is resolved, Tibetan government exile will be dissolved. All the Tibetans in exile, including the prime minister, will be an ordinary person. We can pack our suitcase and go as an ordinary person, not as a CEO, not as a prime minister. President. So our goal in exile is to be the spokesperson for six million Tibetans inside Tibet. That's it. We fight for them. Once their freedom is restored, it's up to them, whatever they want to do with the division. And uh, uh, semi retired, and then 2011, we fully retired, and election of Dalim Shippa, a secret to say. Now, why I say this is this is very important. Is that again, there are 100 million people in diaspora and, and refugees. Among these 100 million, the most organized, most organized organization or government is the Tibetan government exile. That's a fair conclusion. This is the structure of the government exile. Look at this building. Is it beautiful? Yeah, it was built during my time. That's why. I'm trying to show off here. I, I've left my uh, Tibetan hat in Dharamsala. Now I didn't have to be humble and all that. I can afford to be a bit American. <laughs> so, first parliamentarian, fourth <coughs> parliamentarian, the speaker giving speech, and here uh, uh, is my cabinet. Now, our parliament is, my goodness, is lively, to say the least. The BBC makes this, you know, uh, the uh, House of Commons in England, the zero hour, very famous, because <coughs> one prime minister speaks and the opposition leader questions, and the debate goes back and forth, only for an hour. In our parliament, I was asked 150 plus questions for three days in a row. <laughs> And I had to answer all the questions right then and there. 
How do I manage? <coughs> yeah, all the answers, you know. So that my staff sends uh, all the answers, and you know, we can look at the answers. <laughs> and my record was broken by the Home Minister who answered 270 or 300 questions for five days in a row. Which government in the world has executive that accountable that a parliamentarian asks questions, you have to answer every question, only to be in parliament, right? And then the parliamentarian said, well, you can't bring cell phone in the parliament, it disturbs things, you know, it's all that. They banned phones. And I said, for national security, if there's emergency, I have to be informed. I better keep my phone. So I kept my phone. So I answered promptly, you know. So that's not cheating, okay? I meant the law. <laughs> so this is the cabinet uh, building. This is the new building, T building, representing Tibet. Now, this is the part. We run like any other government, okay? Really. Tibet religious culture has offices for the monasteries. Home and interior offices, all the settlements, forces, or so. Finance, we have our own bank, and we have our own fundraising, all that, right? Education, we have like primary, middle, and senior secondary schools, right? High schools. And we give scholarships uh, for children to go to colleges. So, security looks after security, we solve this dilemma and try to get information from inside Tibet. Information, international relations, health, during COVID. Health department plays quite vital. So we have hospitals. Right? So we run, run like any other government, but in a micro level. Right? So headache is safe. So this was my cabinet. Now, Office of the Department of Information Internet Relations. We have semi embassies around the world from New Delhi to Kathmandu, to Washington, DC, to Geneva, Tokyo, London, Brussels, Canberra, Paris, Moscow, Pretoria, Taipei, Brazil. So, you know, it functions like it. And then, <coughs> Tibetan government exile is the most frugally run government in exile ever. Why? Because my salary at the beginning of 2011 was 300 plus dollars a month. Later, I increased the salary to 400 dollars. <coughs> That's my per day now, okay? So, <coughs> there's so many students. How many of you will choose to give up your salary to work for a community? 90% of here we have one. She has high love Tibet, that's why, you know. <laughs> so, this is a labor of love. I used to travel 60% of the time and economy class. And our auditor office is so strict right, that if you don't have boarding, card, they don't reimburse you. Now, my, do my salary is $300 plus, and if I fly to New York, that's like $1,000 to $2,000. If I don't get reimbursed, like my three months or six months salary is gone. The first thing I put in my bag, my boarding pass. Not my passport, boarding pass. Very true. So this is the museum now we have. Now, election is happening. Again, Tibet election is also <coughs> very unique. You have to pay freedom tax, then only you get to vote. You don't pay tax, you don't get to vote. We charge money <laughs> if you want to vote. Normally pay, they pay you money to vote, right? No, no, we charge you money. So look at this, they're all checking whether you have paid your dues or not, the green book. A lot of prayer. We are Tibetans, we pray a lot. So she's praying before she has a ballot. Oh, two moms with toddlers. Praying before she cast, they cast their ballot. Hopefully, they're praying for me at that time. <laughs> <laughs> in a nomadic area, you know, in a tent, we have elderly person voting. Look at this minus degree of the, you can clearly see it's freezing cold, right? And they're voting. And out in the sun, they're having fun and checking, you know, uh, if you think there's a fraud, there's a lot of election fraud going on, you know. This at least debate about, right, in the U.S. We are very cavalier about it. <laughs> Look at the ballot boxes. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the people. In minus 40 degrees, they're carrying ballot boxes. If our volunteers are so dedicated, they're keep sacrificing their lives out there to carry ballot boxes, why should we doubt there will be some, you know, fishy things going on? Not at all. <laughs> 
but with a frozen lake. Can you imagine? Look at the volunteers. So we take it very seriously, okay? Much more seriously than here. <laughs> <laughs> and our election campaigns happen all over the continent. So I had a debate in Dharamsala, next day in Delhi, next day in Switzerland, and two days later in Toronto, three days later in Washington, D.C. Cross continent. Which president or prime minister will campaign cross continent, right? Sometimes they don't show up in their own constitutions, right? And as in 2011, the campaign was quite friendly. So two of the candidates, I'll show you a photograph when you're here. Oh, a lot of monks are voting and thinking who to vote for. <laughs> There's three of us. The former prime minister, most seasoned minister, he served like you know, three or four terms. Very senior most. So at that time, the Speaker of the Parliament, Deputy Speaker, Private Secretary of Dalai Lama, all were candidates. And I was the youngest, least experienced, never voted in Dharamsala. Even my mom didn't think I, had, I would win. Okay? I had no chance of winning at all. <laughs> so don't give up. Okay, When you see there's no chance at all, maybe we have the best chance. Ultimately, I prevailed, right? So three of us are debating. And then you know, two of us are debating in Dharamsala. Next day, we had to go to Delhi. So what did we do? We said, oh, you're going to Delhi? And I'm going to Delhi. Why not take a taxi ride together? We drove in one taxi. And we reached after midnight. Right? And all the hotel rooms were you know, all the hotels were locked. And we were trying to find our assistant Tibetan. They are very efficient. <coughs> okay. We landed in Delhi. Our, uh, the, the supporters were nowhere to be seen. Uh, so, Candidates of prime ministers are coming to Delhi, <coughs> and volunteers have disappeared there. <laughs> so we wanted to, finally we got one room, and both of us, you know, spent together in that room, two separate beds. Okay, don't get <laughs> And the next morning we are having breakfast together, and our supporters were looking at us, and two of us like, we are debating here, fighting over you two, and you two are having friendly breakfast. How can it be possible, right? But that's the way we are doing things. And I gave campaign tips to other candidates, we help each other. So if America does that, you save a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> share bus together, go to one place together, share campaign tips, have joint team campaigning for, let the best men or women win, right? This is 2016. Now, my first test as a leader, now I'll try to switch to leadership. I will try to make a distinction between politician and leader. Now, at Harvard, I spent 16 years, of which maybe 11 years, organizing track three diplomacy. I used to bring, invite Chinese students and scholars, senior scholars, even officials from China, and Tibetan officials and scholars, Indian, Americans, and Europeans. We used to have this track three diplomacy. So the first meeting between mainland Chinese students and scholars and Dalai Lama took place at Harvard. So I used to be the dialogue guy. So some of the Tibetans also used to criticize me for being too soft. How come you are talking to the other side, quote unquote, enemy? Right? How can you expose the alarm to Chinese in one room? I took the risk. That was my uh, experience. And I thought I could contribute something towards the dialogue. When I took over, by 2010, it was pretty clear the dialogue was not moving ahead. By 2012, uh, uh, it was pretty clear uh, it was not moving ahead. And then the two envoys resigned. They made many attempts to go back to China, to meet with the <coughs> And final effort to go to Hong Kong, Geza Genzilla did go to Hong Kong and came back is saying the, their interlocutor, their contact person, uh, is saying the Chinese, they don't want to talk to us. So he came back. Now, all my efforts and all my studies at Harvard, 16 years, was on dialogue. I put all my eggs in one basket. Now, after I got elected, dialogue went out the window. Then I had a hand to the finance department, education department. I was regretting. I, I, I never went to Harvard Business School or Education School, health, health school, to study all the stuff. Then, tragically, self demolition happened in Tibet. Like Harold said, you know, Tibet started burning themselves. So, there were 12 in 2011 when I took over, and then 85 in 2012. Essentially, 
one every four data sets. So, what would you do? Now, Tibetans everywhere, including in Colorado, they are organizing candlelight vision. They all are saying they are the martyrs. They are the heroes. They sacrifice for a cause. We must honor them. We must hold candlelight vision that we must have protests and rallies from high school to college kids to elderly, everybody who are emotionally moved. When 90% of people are going towards one direction, what would politicians do? You follow 90%. That's where the votes are. Yes or no? But then, as a leader, you have to ask yourself, am I going to say, yes, Tibetans, you should burn yourself? <clears throat> you have to ask your conscience, are you okay with it? And I thought about it, thought about it, more I think about it, more I was not okay with it. But then, how do I articulate this? How can I come out and say, hey, don't, don't, don't commit self immolation If I do that, what would Tibetans and Tibet think? What would those self-immolators who have died and their families would think? They would think their son or a daughter or uncle or father made a sacrifice for a cause, and here you are saying, don't do it. I mean, if you don't acknowledge and appreciate it, at least don't condemn it. That would be a reaction, right? Now, so how do we articulate this? And I thought a great deal and then we had a parliament session, everybody saying, show us direction, give us your policy statement on this, you know. And then Japan, I had an answer, then I had media asked me and said, as a human being, life is precious. One should lead and continue to fight for a cause. So don't commit self mutilation But as a Buddhist, anyone who dies, I'll pray for you. I used to shut down my office one hour and then pray those who died after self -immunation. But as a Tibetan, I understand your pain and your aspiration. You want to see the return of Dalai Lama of Tibet. You want to see freedom of Tibet. I support your aspiration. In short, I said, I don't support your action, but I support your aspiration. Now, I got criticized. Who the hell are you to say this? They are doing it voluntarily. No one asked them to do it. They are doing it voluntarily for a cause. And you are saying, don't do it. Why? And people are committing self immolation because they have no alternative, no option. You, you, you organize a protest, you participate in a protest, you get arrested, you get tortured, and you often die in prison. So that's why they concluded, instead of, commit, instead of you know, participating in a protest, suffering for a long time in prison and often dying, it's better you die quickly by burning. So that it's a less pain for you and pain for your family members as well. So it's a very difficult decision. I'm at the core. So that's why I said there's a difference between a politician and a leader. A leader, you should be able to face criticism and hope and pray that in the long run they will understand why I'm at the core. Now, if you ask me whether I was right or wrong, I don't know. History will judge whether I was right or wrong. But at that time, I felt like that. And despite all the, you can clearly see criticism when 90% of people are in one direction, when you go to opposite direction, you can clearly see criticism. But you face it. So, there's another example, but I will you know, not elaborate here. Here it is, you look at candlelight vision. Candlelight vision. People coming out. I wrote an op-ed piece watching, watching the post as well. Now, another part of leadership is this. So, with all this self mutilation happening, tragedy happening, repression happening in Tibet, now I come to Washington, D.C. to report and create awareness in Washington, D.C. among the leadership, right? And I come to Washington, D.C. and the State Department says, you cannot enter the State Department because you are a Prime Minister of Government Exile. We don't recognize you. And I said, okay, but I have all these complaints. I have you know, 6 million Tibetans in Tibet suffering. Where do we meet? In cafeteria, in Starbucks, in a restaurant. What would you do? 
I used to come three or four times to Washington, D.C. Over 10 years, I came 30 or 40 times. All the time, they met me outside. And I thought I had this burden or responsibility of representing six million Tibetans who are suffering and who are burning themselves. And here I am in Washington, D.C. I can't even enter a building or the White House. What would you do? Not just once, twice, 30 times. So do you feel angry? Do you feel humiliated? Do you feel resentment? Do you feel embarrassed? And then maybe do you feel deflated? My God, what am I doing here? It's not working. In 2015 and 16, I had to run for re-election. I knew what was happening around the world. The reception was everybody wanted to engage with China. They want to do business with China. They want to make money with China. They don't want to talk to you. You are a nuisance. You are an obstacle in the money-making machine. Now, everybody talks about democracy and human rights. It's enshrined in constitution. The foreign ministry issues reports and statements, but what about human rights of Tibetan people? No, nah, no, nah, we don't care. You can't even enter the building. What would you do? Again, that's the test. So that's why I came to a conclusion, again. That's why as leadership, I said leadership equals crisis, criticism, and challenges. As a leader, if you want to be a leader, you must embrace crisis, criticism, and challenges to begin with, psychologically, emotionally, so that you are better prepared. When there's crisis, you know, okay, I know it will come. When there's crisis, when there's humiliation, you say, I understand. Because you're taking Karen's class, you're taking Buddhist class. Mm -hmm. I, again, had to think deep. Each time I come to DC, and I'm like, oh, I have a decent credential, okay? I have a master's degree, a doctorate degree from a good university, you know? And then I'm sitting next to someone with less credential than me, and he or she decides what I can say or not, why, where, I, where, where I can read or not, right? I mean, that's unfair. That's unfair. Now, I could be resentful. I could be very angry. I could shout at them and scream, no. I just said, you know, I'm here for six million Tibetans. I have to take this. Because I must reflect them in a positive way. I can't use that suffering, my personal humiliation, as a resentment, as an anger, and show that anger to them. Because they will write in the report, they will say the Tibetan leader misbehaved. Tibetan leader misspoke. That will be on the record. For their sake, I tolerate all this. So that's why you have to have compassion in you. Courage also, compassion-based courage in you to lead a difficult job. So when I, you know, so, uh, from the very beginning when I ran for this position, I knew it was very difficult, don't you agree? Least paying job, very difficult. You have to take on Chinese government. Can you imagine? And you have to influence the whole world to support you, right? It's a harmful tax. It's an impossible tax. You do it because for the love of your nation, for the love of your people. So, but then good news is, again, I'll show you other pictures. But I would receive very well at Congress, okay? The Speaker Nancy Pelosi, my host, he visited Dharamsala here. You know, she was very good host. Congress received me all the time. I could enter the Congress pretty. Uh, Senator John McCain and Julie Burman were my main, main host initially. I talked about Major Leader Harry Reid. He's the one, and she's the one who arranged the meeting, right? Now, not just America. This is Norway, this is Australia. No, the foreign minister of Norway. Norway claims to be a very liberal country, progressive, pro-human rights, pro-conflict resolution. They donated a lot of money, but when it came to Tibet in 2013, no. <coughs> 2016, they used to give $100,000. They cut that off as well. Every year, they downgraded a meeting from a senior uh, uh, staff of foreign ministry to the junior, to the junior most, to an intern. Why? 
after the foreign minister left his office in 2016, he got elected as the president of World Economic Forum. That was. And his first guest was President Xi Jinping of China. So he had a clear cut strategy. Ambition lined up. Downgrade his veterans, upgrade his promotion at the cost of human rights. And also the foreign minister of Australia, I was in Australia, the foreign minister Bob Carr said, no, 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 media asked him, are you going to meet him? He said, no, I'm not meeting this guy, not at all. What happened, I was going to the parliament, I took the elevator, elevator door opened, who walked in, foreign minister of Australia. And the, our local parliament introduced me, hey, this is Sikyong Lok San Senge, he's the foreign minister of Australia, we shook hands. So we had no formal meeting, but karmic meeting. Karma moves sometimes. So, and I have had many experiences like that. Okay. And then finally, oh, before I come to this, I should, I should, I should build this up. You know, I should build, build this. So, this is the University of Toronto. If you thought that you know, it's other parts of the world, look, Chinese people, students protesting against my visit. They're singing Chinese national anthem. This is in South Africa. They stormed the campus auditorium like this. 100 migrants and 30 Chinese. Massive protest. This is the press release issued by Chinese embassy in South Africa, okay? The Lok Sang Senge is a troublemaker. He's here to affect what we call disrupt the peaceful relationship between South Africa and you know, uh, China and all that. They told me to get out. <laughs> so stop splitting Tibet from China. This is their slogan. But this is Australia, Parliament, uh, the, the media, this is Canada. So this is Czech Republic, as Karen mentioned. I think three of the five vice presidents of the Senate hosted a formal reception, and all the senators came. Jay Wallace, our college, Dalai Lama, these are the Indian leaders. Now let me get back to this. After 10 years, of making efforts, I was rejected. Finally, in October of 2010, I entered the State Department. You can clap. <laughs> this is called Buddhist persuasion. You know? So they used to say, oh, we can't meet you, you're a prime minister of government. I said, yeah, but you just met with the Syrian parliament, the Syrian government. The leader just went to the seventh floor and met Hillary Clinton, and they were sanctioned $360 million. Right here. I have a good degree, okay? I take notes. <laughs> Don't say that government exiles are not welcome inside the State Department. Venezuelan government exile was welcome. Kurdish leaders were welcome. They were given $650 million. We take notes. We are not that stupid. Don't give me this government exile. That this is Nixon Kissinger legacy of 1970. That the Tibetan government exile be not allowed to enter the State Department should be thrown out. I mean, President Nixon has died a long time ago, right? But his legacy limit is blocked. Me. Finally, we entered the State Department. Robert Destro, he was the special coordinator of the Tibetan issue. He made it possible. One bureaucrat was bold enough to say, I take responsibility, I'll sign the paper. Welcome. That's it. Then we entered the State uh, White House as well, right? That's when I got that Pfizer vaccine, okay? <laughs> Just to make sure, we have a photograph. We make sure, I'm sure, I'm the Colorado, which leading I, I should have come in on. I should have come on the photograph. Now, this is the, how much time do I have, Carol? Is it going okay? It's going okay. Um, it's 8 o'clock. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> what does it mean, 8 o'clock mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just wrap up in five minutes. Okay. Now, the error of being a government exile. So, in 2017, Doklam incident happened in India. You know Doklam? It's between Sikkim and Bhutan, you know, uh, area. The Chinese troops had it, it moved in, and there was a huge issue. And then uh, I was in news media. Then that July, that was in April, I think. That's in July. I went to Ladakh. There's a famous lake called Pangom Lake. 
And other side is Tibet, and this side is you know, uh, India, the uh, lake. So there, uh, the, you know, there is a Tibetan a person who was, who was married to a Ladakhi woman. He hosted this flag, and it, this Tibetan flag has been you know, standing there for 27 years. So now technology is such that I was there. I went to look at this photograph, right? And then I was, I was looking, that side is Tibet and all that. So our official photograph took a photograph, and then the Wi-Fi connection was so bad, the data was so bad, he barely managed to send one photograph to Dharamsala, pretty much where the government exile is. And then they released the photograph. The Indian news media caught hold of it. And then like uh, Indian media asked, started asking our secretary of the department, I said, hey, Tibetan leader has gone to Pangon Lake and hosted Tibetan flag. What do you think? And the secretary said, we are very proud. Our Sichong has hosted Tibetan flag in Pangon Lake across Chinese troops, right? We are very proud. The news media ran with it. What the hell is going on? How can a Tibetan leader go to Pangon Lake? When we just had an incident a few months ago, the Chinese troops and Tibetan, the Chinese troops and Indian troops facing each other, right? But what happens is because I was, I was, yeah, what do you call it? We just could not communicate because phone was dead in that area, it's quite remote. So after two days, I reached Leh, Ladakh, that's the capital of Ladakh. And then all these people are saying, hey, what did you do? You're all over the news. I said, what did I do? I didn't do anything. You hosted that flag. No, that, was, that flag was standing there for 27 years. News <laughs> media. <laughs> and then I tweeted. I said, the flag was already there for 27 years. I just went to look at it. And I just went for a religious spiritual purpose because he always has sent me some you know, uh, food and things like that to offer to the gods and deities of the lake, which the other side is Tibet, right? So I said, look at this. I'm throwing this you know, uh, food uh, to the lake. And I released that uh, video. <laughs> Media is such that they said, look at this video. There is an Indian policeman with automatic machine gun next to me. So he was not only hoisting the flag, he was provided security by the government of India because there's this guy. This guy was so religious, more religious than me. Whatever I did, he was following me, you know? He was supposed to guard me because I was throwing it. He was equally with me. So he was caught in the video. I completely forgot about him. So, and then I've said, enough now. Don't make, don't say anything, you know? So, um, and this is it. This is the first Prime Minister Modi's inauguration, 2014. And I had some friends uh, in the BGB as well. And they just sent a message, hey, can I come? They said, yes, you can. They sent me a card, and it said VIP. And in India, VIP means a lot. I mean, VIP means a lot of things, OK? So there's VIP, 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 a lot of things. <laughs> so I got this card and I went to like six, seven hundred people, you know, I don't thousand people or so. I showed the card and he didn't he kept saying you go forward, you go forward. I went in first row and the second row, third row. I was in front row. I said, like, what the hell? Where am I? You know, I just looked at the Prime Minister and everybody was the Mount Bon Singh, you know, Sonia Gandhi, all the group, that row. I was like, am I in the wrong row? You know? Someone said, No, this is your row, this is where you should be sitting, you know. Then I sat. Here I was. Oh, this is the wrong photograph. Yeah, there was a chief minister of Uttar Pradesh and Salman Khan and all that stuff. Oh, this is the wrong photograph. Sorry. Uh, I thought I was showing up. I sat next to an Indian superstar and all that. Uh, so, then before I went to bed, I just wrote on my Facebook, what a privilege to go to Rashtrapati Bhavan, the presidential palace of India, to attend the inaugural ceremony. I slept. Next day, all over the news. How did he get in into the president's palace of India? This is a, a diplomatic disaster. And the Chinese foreign ministry demanded uh, the ambassador in China and said, how can you allow him to go in? How did this happen? Nobody had any clue. <laughs> I know, when I write my memoir, I'm going to write, but I'm not going to change it. <laughs> so, and then, after a year, I met a friend. He said, you know what? Chinese are still complaining about you. I said, it's been a year. It's all news. Why? The two reasons. One, you, you got invited. Second, you were sitting ahead of Chinese ambassador who was in the second row. <laughs> <laughs> Double insulted, you know? 
<laughs> so again, can you uh, just exile leader, right? You just get a car, you go, and then you're in the news, you know? So this is what you have. And this is the final one I just shared with you. And then I just attended this event. This is the symbol of the Minister of uh, India, a very powerful person, a very well-known you know, uh, leader. And then that person, right next to it, is the former Prime Minister of India, Nepal, Sherwat Dube. So he speaks Nepali, I speak Nepali, I am from Dajli. So you know, we all are keynote speakers, so we were all sitting in the front row. And he came and sat next to me, and I said, I said, hi, and how are you? You know, we chatted. I spoke, he's also responding. Now he goes back to Nepal. And after a month or so, he was supposed to take over as the Prime Minister of Nepal. Then the news broke out and said, Sherpa Duduba met the Dalai Lama. Chinese are unhappy. How can you have a prime minister who met the Dalai Lama? And his spokesperson came up and said, no, Sherry Bhattacharya did not meet with Dalai Lama. No, 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 he met with Dalai Lama's man. <laughs> and they said, no. Let me show this horse guy. That's my new What's this? It's a breaking news in their farm. <laughs> this is Dalai Lama's man here. Well, I didn't even know who he was. I didn't even notice him. I kept quiet. <laughs> Had I spoken, I would have delayed his prime ministership, right? So, as a politician, what would you do? Media coverage. I should get that. You run for it. As a leader, nah. Mm. You know, I'm a Buddhist. I don't want to have bad, bad karma, right? Let him have him, you know? And after a few months, he, got, he became the prime minister. So he's in the ruling party now. So, as a leader, exile leader, this is the peril of exile leader, is that my job is the most difficult. Why? What if I say or do doesn't impact anybody? What if it happens around the world impacts me? Even if I attend the event, it's in the news. For no fault of mine. You know? So, with that, I just want to end my talk. And, uh, you know, if you have questions, answer. And if you have some clarifications to be made, I'm happy to answer. So, what a privilege. An honor to be here. Thank you very much for your patience. Yes, 
is on the job training. For example, uh, you saw him giving a teaching in Minnesota, Buddhist teaching, and I was in attendance. So after teaching, he asked me, did you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> now, you're talking to his solidness. You don't lie. You lie, you go to hell. <laughs> so, you have to be honest, and then you can stretch a bit. As a young just when you were speaking, I, I could understand 60, 70% of what you're saying. But then, I'm a lawyer. I think I must have different spectrums. So if you ask, what did you understand? I don't really know. But by the time you finish teaching, I forgot most of it. <laughs> it's true. It's true. But I said, the problem I had became small. You know, the problem that I was facing became small. You saw no, no, no. Problem doesn't become small. Your perspective becomes bigger. For example, you said, the problem you had, whatever problem you had as a leader, previous other leaders for hundreds of years have faced similar or same problem. For hundreds of years to come, leaders will face similar or same problem. Now that you know that all the leaders face problem, and some solve it, some don't solve it, you have a holistic bigger picture, and the problem before you becomes small. I mean, perspective becomes bigger, so the problems look smaller. The problem is the same. Then I said, you know, that's right. So many leaders have tried to solve the problem. Some have solved, some have not. For hundreds of years, some will try, some will solve, some will not. Who the heck am I? I don't have to solve all the problems. I'll give my best. I solve some problem. I do some, solve some problem. So you don't get obsessed with the result. But you have to be obsessed with your efforts. As long as you make efforts, solution or success has so many variables, so many factors. You, you don't have control over it. So nowadays people are so driven by ambition, so obsessed with the result. When you don't get it, you are like stressed and you are depressed and then you know you commit suicide and all that thing because you are driven towards the result. But rather, you should be driven towards effort. And if you're lucky, you succeed. Sometimes, if you're not lucky, you don't succeed, but it's not for you to be blaming, you make your efforts. So there are many examples, right? Many people have said on this. So, uh, that's how he helped me. And then personally, uh, I toured seven countries in Europe in 11 days. Right? So I went back. And so he saw was leaving early in the morning somewhere, and I was also going back to Dharamsala. So I had early morning audience with the Solomons, like 7 a.m. or something. I went to his room and I saw. So he could, he could clearly say, I landed last night. I was jet lagged and groggy, and I had a bit of a sinus in a you know, you get a solar face in the morning. And then I was like, you're just in my trip to Europe and very well. I went to seven countries in 11 days, and I was posting him. Very, very, very good. And by the way, I'll teach you a mantra, OK? You recite that mantra, it will help you. I said, thank you. You know, I said, But he was more concerned about my health than looking at my face. <laughs> you know? and then, you know, at the same time, he's been very encouraging. Very, very good. I'll give you a mantra. Mantra is Pandal Hamu. Uh, goddess, that much. And I'm sometimes you look at this, did you understand? I said, no. <laughs> I had no idea which mantra he was talking about. <laughs> and he called the secretary, and told him, he also didn't understand. He consulted with someone in Dharamsala. Finally, I got the English version you know, of the mantra. Because you know, <laughs> my Tibetan is of school <laughs> kids standard. So then I memorized it. So by the time my fl uh, the flight landed, in Dharamsala, I memorize it. So, wherever I go, I recite that mantra. I show Ramu, show Ramu, show Ramu, 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 you can look at the photograph. He was very nice to me. You know, he was he was praising me, and still, you know, he just, he, you know. So, you know, it's 
great leader in Aberdeen, he's very intuitive, he senses, right? And then he says and does exactly the things that you expect from a leader. And he does it genuinely. You know? That's why uh, we love him so much. Other questions? Uh, you're clearly very skilled in public speaking, and as someone who has um, presented, I suppose, an argument to people, uh, such as in the, the Department of State, who um, are unwilling to hear your side of the story, I was wondering if you had any um, advice when it comes to those kind of frustrating situations? Uh, of course. First, you know, uh, it depends on your personality. Right? Some are extroverts, some are introverts, some are temper, some have don't. And my uh, staff members always said, I don't show temper. So recently they told me, they know when I'm losing my temper. Because once I'm in the car, once I start you know, patting on my leg like this, then they say, oh, we have to tone down what we have to say. Because he's, you know, he's, that's, so that's the uh, level of my anger at my staff. Once I start saying, or oh, something happened, nothing happened, okay. Then they're all like, okay, dear, this guy has become a lion. My second name is lion. <clears throat> uh, but generally, you know, I think through persuasion, you, know, you must have a long-term goal. And then, you know, each time you meet them, you know, you, we all should realize the other side is also human being. They know what they're doing is wrong. I mean, they feel it. I mean, they come out and say, the department say, hey, hey, let's meet here. Let's meet. I mean, in, in the, you, you can sense that they, they also feel bad. It's just that they, they don't have the power or the courage to override previous judgment or decision. So that's how they do it. Right? And then, but then I say, why? But I always ask them, I give, give them a bit of guilt trip. I say, why? Huh? They say, oh, government exile. I said, don't give me that. I know many government exiles. They run out, they run out of arguments. Then now, more fuller story. So in the State Department, there are like seven inter-agencies there to debate, right? Uh, whether I should be allowed or not. Each time I meet with them, you persuade them, you impress them that he's a decent guy, he should be inside the building, right? So one agency agree with you, the second and the third and the fourth. So uh, when October of 2020, when I entered, it was a culmination of seven inter-agencies over years each one of them came to support me, and the seventh one was lying, and then the special coordinator agreed. So in a persuasion, right? So you just, whatever they're saying, politely but gently, make sure that their argument is wrong, decision is wrong. But then, don't push it. You just say, hey, next time when I come, I hope it's possible. In fact, the, uh, the ambassador for religious uh, freedom uh, he felt so bad. Uh, in fact, in November of 2019, six of the interagency had agreed that I should be allowed in. Right? Only the one agency, that's the China division, East Asia division, they objected. So this guy went to meet Secretary of State Pompeo in the morning. He, he told him all the eight agencies are agreeing to allow me in. My meeting was at 9.30. He was meeting at 9 a.m. He said, can we allow him? And then Pompeo said, hey, we should listen to the bureaucrats, East Asian Division, right? And then next time when I came, when Robert Destro, a special coordinator, learned that six agencies, inter-agencies, agreed, and then he, you know, for him it was an easy decision. So persuasion, what they call still valid strategy, you know, that's like still arguments, but covered with velvet. So it feels smooth, right? When you need, they get the pain. <laughs> when they go to bed, like, oh my God, doctor came again, I had to deny him. You know, deprive them, him or her, of sleep for a few days, it's okay. So next time when I say, when I write to him, say, I'm coming, it's like, oh my God, I better do something, you know. And finally they do it after 10 years of patience. The Buddha took 12 years to get enlightened, so 10 years is pretty short. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's a question, yeah. Um, of all the countries that you've visited, from your perspective, who do you think are the best biggest allies? Biggest allies? Now, having, having said all that, America still is the biggest ally. <laughs> really, it's true. Now, but bigger than, 
America, India. <laughs> because India, uh, politically, because I didn't, I didn't say India, because politically India, you know, doesn't say things you know, overtly. But for Tibetans, they have a government exam. How we function like any government to allow all that to have the first uh, you know, immigrants to come and settle, give us land. 99% of Tibetan monasteries and nunneries were destroyed in Tibet, and we rebuilt major monasteries back in Tibet. We have our own schools where we provide education to our children, right? We have everything. So, India, at a humanitarian level, but political too, right? That's the foundation. Then, my, then Japan, then Czech Republic. Japan has the largest parliamentary support group. 100 parliamentarians have formed a group in support of Japan. The Czech Republic has 55 parliamentarians. Now, sitting president and the prime minister of Czech Republic are pro Tibet as well. So you never know. Yep, there was a question. Yep. I think one of the things that I heard in the news a few years back disturbed me possibly more than other things I heard, and that was when the Tibetan children were denied the right to speak Tibetan in the schools. Yes. And it seems to me that, I wonder if you could speak a bit, it seems to me the war is not just a political thing, but it's a war on the actual culture. Itself. It's at Do you every think level. That's true? Yeah, political repression, yeah. social discrimination, economic marginalization, environmental destruction, all taking place at the same time. So, as I gave an example about news media not covering one million Tibetan children uprooted from their families, nomadic families and farming families, and sent to boarding school where Chinese language is mandatory. Curriculum is taught in Chinese language. Essentially, they are made into Chinese. So this is happening now. So UN has expressed concern. Reports has come out. News media don't cover it. So yeah, it, it is. It is. Yeah. Maybe time for one more question. I was just wondering if you meditate and if if you meditate and if you think that like has the potential to like foster compassion, especially in like the challenges that you face? Now I'm culturally Buddhist. I don't have uh, set meditations and things like that, but I sleep a lot. So, <laughs> um, I like, everybody knows, everybody knows that. For example, uh, annually we have these uh, uh, oracle consultations. You know, oracles come, you know, and they do divination and and it's always early in the morning, 7.30 a.m. Uh, and then we all are told to come at 6.45. And everybody knows I show up at 7.25. Now, they can make it so as the I'm being played for. So every year on the 10th of Tibetan New Year, again, Oracle Consultation happens in the presence of Isol as the right? This is serious. It is serious. It's all is coming. All the cabins, everybody goes there. <laughs> and I'm the only one sleeping, you know. And then they're texting me, hey, wake up, you saw this, I'm about to come, you are getting late, you know. Everybody's waiting, and I barely make it. And one day I was late, and he saw this come. And he went to the altar, uh, other, other room, and he came back and said, see, you come. And he gave me a big box, one box. They say, in Tibet, we will be whipped, you know that? You know? But we get only this for being late. As I said, again, you saw the Dalai Lama being playful, right? Now, for someone who said, my goodness, he got, he got whooped by the Dalai Lama, for me, I said, my, after when I came out, what happened? I got blessed. <laughs> but the uh, Lama said, my sins been against <laughs> So it's a matter of perspective, you know? So meditation is very good, I know, it's very helpful. But I try, you know, and, but I don't have a regular. But those who pray, those who meditate, they are much more calm. Really, uh, I can say definitely helps a lot. And His Holiness Dalai Lama does the most difficult meditation. You know his meditation? It's called Tonglen. 
give and take. You give love to your enemy, you take hatred from your enemy. You try that. Meditate every morning. You give love to your enemy, you take hatred from your enemy. Sometimes you don't give love to your boyfriend. You can't take hatred from your boyfriend. <laughs> we have problems. We have problems. Don't you think so? With a husband and wife, each year there's a diminishing, lot of diminishing return. Life, right? But he's told it every morning. <laughs> every morning. But no. I mean, honest. Every morning he does that. So, you know, he said he's meditating it. Now, meditating doesn't simply mean that he closes his eyes and then just, just recite his mantra. It's an analytical meditation, meaning he analyzes why. Right? Giving love to your enemy is beneficial. Taking hatred from your enemy is beneficial to you. Through analysis, he comes to a conclusion, he persuades himself. That's the best way. And then, and I, I was like, mm, you saw this, you know, uh, that argument sounds, you know, uh, a little difficult. I said, no, no, no. Imagine. Imagine. Compassion is a very effective tool, even to defeat your enemy. I was like, what kind of argument is that? I was, but you dare not say that in solidness, right? He said, for example, someone who doesn't like you says something nasty to you, does something nasty to you. Now, you get angry, right? You're frustrated. And uh, you lose sleep at night, you know? And in the morning, you get up, you're grumpy. You lose appetite. Other few days, you look like Gobi. And the other enemy will say, look at that. I got her. <laughs> I put her in place. Right up. When that guy says something nasty to you, smile. More nasty to you, smile. <laughs> Harshest thing at you, it says, say, thank you very much. <laughs> then the other side is like, what the heck, you know? I said all these nasty things. My God, he or she is still smiling. What the, what the hell is going on? You lose sleep. Next thing, you're broken. You lose appetite. You look like a And he said, gotcha. <laughs> compassion works. He said, compassion is very effective. You know, but, at, but then at a deeper level, at a deeper level, also compassion is effective. So when he told me that, I said, ah, that sounds good. You know? So you asked me, how did I handle the state department? All that. I said, well, compassion, smile, you know. Um, so that's how you do it. So, and then the other meditation Solinus does is he visualizes death every morning. Because, you know, in Buddhism, again, I mean, for example, if there's a question, why I dedicated 10 years of my life for a Tibetan cause, and why be a leader, things like that. As a Buddhist, we are told, you are born, you die. Birth and death are two sides of the same point. So we look at death as inevitable. Then you say, okay, what do I do in life? What difference can I make? But then those who look at only birth and celebrate birthdays, when there is 50, the midlife crisis, oh my goodness, I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm going to die. No one told me that. <laughs> right? But we already embrace death. And then you say, you know what? While I live, I better do something for cause, for community, you know? So before I die, I won't have regrets. I won't say, my goodness, I have 10 buildings and 10 houses and 10 cars. Now where are they, you know? I can't take them. But I say, no, I tried. I tried something for my cause. I did the best I could. Where are you I tried going, to change bro? Tibetan people's you know, status. Try to do something here. No regrets. So you don't cling on to your world. You know, so now that's why everybody says, you saw why he saw that I was always fine, why he's happy. Every money who he overcomes enemy, he overcomes death. That is a happy man. <laughs> Don't you think so? So that's what it is. I'm not being nihilistic here, okay? Being realistic. So um, that's what Buddhist Buddhism teaches you. So I do embrace Buddhism. I do. But I, I wish I could do daily meditation. But I do feel that I try to uh, capture the essence of all the teachings, and I try to practice it. That's my meditation. Thank you very much.
but also a farewell and, and greeting. Sure. Thank you very much.